Okay. Happy Wednesday. Uh, I have a couple of notes for you at the top. Uh, today, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development uh, Marsha Fudge released a statement committing to do everything in HUD's power to stop evictions for families with HUD assistance or families who rent in housing that is insured by the Federal Housing Administration. This is part of delivering on what the President uh, announced or we announced in our statement just a couple of days ago. And while the emergency rental assistance funds are in the hands of state and local governments, one of the critical roles that the administration can continue to play is to act as a leading hub to convene states and cities and to share best practices, as we have done at two major eviction prevention summits. So this morning, Treasury published examples of simplified forms that are being used effectively by emergency rental assistance programs across, around the country. I think. Ebony may have asked a, a version of this yesterday, a question about this, but Treasury has repeatedly discouraged uh, undue documentation burdens, the limit access for eligible families, and is sharing these example forms to make it easier for state and local governments to put that into practice. Places that have are seeing results. I mentioned Virginia yesterday, but uh, as an example, Virginia is the second highest nationwide distributor of ERA funds in the nation and has given out 223 million to tenants and landlords in need. Virginia followed Treasury's guidance to eliminate documentation burdens that slowed on application processing for eligible families, and the state was able to significantly cut down application processing times by streamlining what is often the most time-consuming part of the eligibility verification and a barrier for people applying. So this is a, uh, a process that we're trying to uh, share best practices, and the Treasury Department is trying to simplify these forms to make it easier for families. As I mentioned yesterday, we're going to continue to highlight what the bipartisan infrastructure deal will mean for families across the country, as we will uh, digitally as well. Right now, there are up to 10 million homes with lead service lines and pipes. Children in up to 400,000 schools and child care facilities are at risk of exposure to lead. For kids, high exposure to lead can negatively affect academic performance and can lead to cardiovascular disease later in life. And the President clearly thinks that's unacceptable, as do a number of members of Congress. And that's why the deal makes the largest investment in clean drinking water in American history, replacing all of the nation's lead pipes and service lines from rural towns to struggling cities. The deal invests in water infrastructure across America, including in tribal nations and disadvantaged communities that need it most. Um, I wanted to also take a moment to recognize the passing of Pentagon Force Protection Officer George Gonzalez, who was tragically killed yesterday in the line of duty. His life was one of service, a veteran of both the police and the military. He served the Federal Bureau of Prisons, the Transportation Security Administration, and the United States Army, where he was awarded the Army Commendation Medal for his service in Iraq. He lost his life protecting those who protect the nation. We mourn his loss and offer condolences to his family. Uh, two more short notes, hopefully helpful. Uh, this morning at the White House as part of our ongoing efforts to, every, to do everything we can and engage everyone we can to encourage vaccinations. Surgeon General uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy uh, and members of the White House COVID-19 response team convened a historic gathering of all living former U.S. Surgeon Generals, including uh, Dr. Uh, Antonia Novella, Dr. Jocelyn Elders, Dr. David Satcher, Dr. Richard Carmona, Dr. Re Regina Benjamin, and Dr. Jerome Adams. Uh, these esteemed public health leaders who served under both Republican and Democratic presidents discussed the importance of ensuring that communities of color, those hard hit by, hit by the virus, have the information and access they need to get vaccinated. Uh, and they discussed uh, how we can work together, of course, moving forward. Last point for all of you, the President uh, spoke or called, I should say, uh, Chantel Brown last night, extended his congratulations to her. He is focused on delivering for the people of Ohio and across the country, as is she. Uh, we know his agenda, including invest in, investing in our country's infrastructure, helping grow our economy, creating good paying middle class jobs, is broadly popular with the American people. He's laser focused on delivering more Democrats, means more ability to deliver on that. Uh, I know you were up way too early this morning based on my television. I've been waiting to do that joke all week. Here we are. Go ahead. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Few top questions all on the same topic, short sure. ones, perhaps. Uh, yesterday, the, the president said Governor Cuomo should resign. Uh, the governor has not done so. Uh, has the president called the governor? No. Has anyone from the White House called the governor or the governor's staff? Not that I'm aware of. When was the last time the president and Governor Cuomo spoke? I would have to check on that. Okay, there's two more on this. Uh, if, the pre if the governor refuses to resign, does the president want to see him impeached and removed from office? 
The President made clear yesterday that Governor Cuomo should resign, and we, I believe we should start with that. There's obviously a process that's going to proceed, and leaders in New York spoke to that yesterday. We'll leave it to them to speak to that, but the President believes Governor Cuomo should do the right thing, resign, uh, and leave space for future leadership uh, in New York. And then there's been a lot of discussion in here, including the President, in recent days about the vital role that governors play in the nation's mm -hmm. COVID response. Uh, in this period, while Governor Cuomo is still in office, does the President have confidence in him leading New York State's response to the pandemic? Well, I think, again, the President made clear uh, because of the abhorrent allegations that uh, were made public yesterday that it is time for, for Governor Cuomo to resign. Uh, at the same time, uh, we do not want the people of New York uh, to uh, be impacted in a negative way as they're working to fight COVID. And we're going to continue to work with uh, the administration in New York, uh, with leaders in New York, to continue to fight COVID. Uh, that will continue. And obviously, if leadership changes in the state, we will work with, with a different leader. Go ahead. Jen, can you walk us through what changed from Monday to Tuesday when it comes to the eviction ban? On Monday, Gene Sperling stood here and said the CDC has been unable to find the legal authority for even new targeted eviction moratoriums. There are many people across the administration who said the same thing, and yet uh, the CDC did just get that yesterday. So what changed? Well, I think it's important to take a step back a f little bit before that to Sunday when uh, we were engaged, the administration, the White House was engaged uh, directly with the CDC at the direction of the President to ask them to uh, look into what legal options, if any, uh, if any uh, existed, there were to extend the eviction moratorium. Uh, that process was underway for a couple of days. The announcement yesterday was a reflection of exactly that. And when we put out a statement on Monday, uh, right before Gene Sperling came out to the briefing, right before we came out to talk with all of you, that also made clear in there that at that time, they had not yet found uh, a legal pathway forward. What the, was announced yesterday was not an extension of the existing moratorium, which was, of course, national. It was a more limited moratorium that was going to be uh, impacting uh, uh, and helping areas that were hardest hit by COVID, so different than the last moratorium. Uh, that was also reflected in the statement that we issued on Monday, that that was the President's ask to look into a more limited moratorium. They did that, um, they, uh, and yesterday's announcement was a reflection of that process message to progressives who say they're worried that President Biden's concerns about the constitutionality of this move will end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy and motivate opponents to go ahead and file suit now? Well, I would first say the President shares their desire, their commitment, uh, and their interest in keeping uh, renters and uh, people in their homes. Uh, and that is exactly why he took the step of asking the CDC to look into what legal pathways forward there were. And yesterday's announcement was a reflection of that. We don't control the courts. Uh, we don't know what they will do. Uh, we, we are uh, all uh, aware of the Supreme Court decision at the end of June and what was outlined in their decision at the end of June. This is also going to be a temporary, uh, temporary solution regardless, and longer-term solution will require legislative action. But his message to uh, anyone who's been in a passionate advocate is that he shares their concern. He shares their commitment. He wants renters uh, to be able to stay in their home, and that's why we took this step over the last few days. And on one other topic, if you don't mind, I know that the President has asked the Defense Secretary to look into mm -hmm. the possibility of making the COVID vaccine mandatory for service members, but according to uh, the U.S. Code, it's actually the President who has to grant a waiver to the military to make vaccines mandatory. Has he granted that waiver yet, and if not, does he plan to do so? Well, the President's looking for a recommendation from the Secretary of Defense. Uh, that hasn't been made yet. Uh, and when, if and when that is made, uh, I would expect he would respond accordingly. Go ahead, Kelly. The uh, earlier moratorium used the same legal justification that the new one is using, which in layman's terms is about preventing the spread of disease if you evict people at a time of uh, pandemic. So the, the only real difference is narrowing uh, location, but the rationale is the same. So after the President was clear that it wasn't legal, Gene Sperling was clear that it wasn't legal, is this a roll the dice and see if it gets challenged position from an administration that may be doing something it knows is not on legal standing? Well, the President would not have supported 
moving forward with any action where he wasn't, didn't feel there was uh, legal standing and legal support. Uh, we obviously don't control what the courts do. Uh, and we, we have, uh, of course, seen what the Supreme Court uh, decided and how they ruled, which was not related to public health, as you well know, Kelly, and was related to the relationship between the landlord and the renter. Uh, but uh, this is different in that it is more targeted. Uh, it is focused on counties with higher substantial case rates uh, uh, to protect renters, and, and CDC ultimately decided, decided to adopt it. I would also note that the conditions have changed. Uh, the rise of the Delta variant, especially in communities where there are large numbers of unvaccinated individuals, where there are growing case numbers, uh, is certainly something that has raised the alarm for us. It has raised the alarm for members of Congress, and it has certainly uh, added to the need to take this additional step. We were uh, in the event with uh, Dr. Murthy earlier, and he talked about the likelihood that boosters would eventually be required. For Americans who are sort of taking it on their themselves and trying to seek out a third shot, what is the administration's view of those who are trying to, you know, self-boost, for lack of a better term? Well, um, I've never heard that term before, but <laughs> I'm, it's interesting. Um, okay. Uh, I would say that um, what we've been conveying to uh, officials around the country um, who have implemented this in some places is that this is not in alignment with the guidance of the public health uh, of public health officials, whether that is the CDC or the FDA. And we are certainly in touch with local officials on that matter and conveying exactly that. Uh, we also, at the same time, are prepared if the FDA decides that they are going to recommend a booster. That is why we ordered the number of doses we did order several months ago, uh, because we are like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and always want to be prepared. So we are prepared for that, but it is not what the FDA and the CDC are recommending, and we are conveying that directly to officials. Uh, thank you, Jen. There's been a major push here recently to protect tenants from being evic evicted right now. Why isn't more being done to help the landlords who are struggling to pay their bills because they're not being paid? Well, actually, the landlords can benefit from exactly the same emergency rental assistance uh, that uh, renters can benefit from. But right now, as we understand it, many states are not distributing that money. The Washington Post says that this measure could drive thousands of minor landlords to bankruptcy. Well, that's exactly why, and I'm happy to have you as a partner in this effort. Uh, we are trying to advocate for states, localities, to get this money out. There's no reason it's not going out to landlords, to renters, no reason that people who are eligible are not benefiting. And we've seen a number of states, red states and blue states, do this very effectively. Texas is an example I used yesterday. Virginia is one I highlighted today. This is why we're doing uh, as much of this outreach and engagement as we're doing and simplifying forms, making it easier for people to understand. Okay. And then on immigration, uh, it's been almost four months since the president told migrants, don't come, don't leave your town. Almost two months since the vice president went to Central America to say, do not come. But people are coming in record numbers. Does the president think his immigration plan is working? Well, the president continues to convey uh, to anyone, as you've said, uh, who wants to come to the United States, now is not the time to come. It is not the time to come and try to go through a regular migration. We want to have an effective process where you can apply uh, for asylum, where you can apply for legal status. We have increased our investment in areas like the Central American Miners Program, allowing people to apply from within country so they are not making that dangerous trip. There's more that needs to be done. Uh, we've also instituted a, a, a number of additional steps recently, uh, including expedited removals. Uh, to move people out of the country more quickly, uh, but we're, it's a, it's a, it's, we're still at work on a, an improving a process and improving a system that was very broken when we took office. So the message to migrants is the same, even though they are coming at 21-year high, 210,000 encounters at the border last month. And I would also note the number of people who were uh, who were removed from the border, which is an important part of the context, which is almost half of that number. But he's saying don't come, and they're coming. Well, there are a number of factors, as you all know, uh, that are happening in these countries, and we're working to address those as well. And the Vice President is leading those efforts. We don't expect that to be a switch, uh, but addressing root causes in these countries, corruption, economic downturn, people are fleeing uh, a range of challenges, uh, persecution, uh, those are issues we need to address at the same time. Go ahead. Uh, sort of a housekeeping question. Um, sure. 
in the status of COVID and, and, and the Delta variant, what is the, the status on the permanent pick for an FDA commissioner? I don't have an update for you. Obviously, the president would love to have a permanent pick in place and wants to nominate the right person, but I don't have an update on the timeline What's for that. Taking so long? He's not going to get it. He's not going to expedite it if he does not has not identified the right person to nominate quite yet. And on the Governor Cuomo um, issue, if if this is potentially such a stain on the party, uh, the president as the leader of this party, why not pick up the phone and ask him to resign at this point? I think the president was pretty clear publicly. He asked him to resign yesterday. No plans to call him, though. I don't have any. Uh, no plans to call him to preview. No. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, Jen, the, sort of picking up on Kelly's question, the WHO today called on uh, countries basically to put a halt on booster shots of the COVID vaccine. I know that's not the policy yet of the United States, but it does appear as though we're moving in that direction, at least for people who are immunocompromised. What's the White House reaction to his call to put that off until at least the end of September so that poorer countries can get more vaccine? Well, Jeff, we feel that it's a false choice uh, and that we can do both. Uh, we announced just yesterday that we hit an important milestone of over 110 million vaccines donated to the world. That is more than any other country has shared combined. We also made clear that that is the beginning, and we also started to donate the 500 million doses of Pfizer we've purchased. Uh, we will start to donate those later this month. Uh, so we've taken action on the global level uh, far more than any country around the world. We're asking the global community to also step up. We saw some action on, at the G7. More needs to happen. But we believe we can do both. We also, in this country, have enough supply to ensure that every American has access to a vaccine. We will have enough supply to ensure if the FDA decides that boosters are recommended for a portion of the population to provide those as well. We believe we can do both and we don't need to make that choice. Right. On, a, on a separate topic, is the White House tracking the case of the Belarus Olympian who was forced to go to the airport and then ended up going to Austria instead of back to her own country? And is the U.S. providing any assistance to her or anyone else on the Belarusian team? Uh, we are aware of the case. I would have to check if there's direct assistance. Uh, the State Department may be the best source for that, but I will check with them and see if there's anything to provide to all of you. Go ahead. Um, who inside the administration signed off on the legality of what the CDC proposed yesterday? Is that the CDC's lawyers, Justice Department? Uh, the CDC's lawyers as well as our counsel's office, yes. I'm, I'm not aware of the Department of Justice's engagement, but uh, of course that might make sense. I would have to check on that. And then, you know, the President alluded yesterday to, look, if this gets struck down in court, if nothing else, it buys time for the federal funds on the state level to be kicked out and dispersed. How much of that was a driving force behind the decision to move forward with this? That, look, we need to figure out some way to buy time as states figure this out. Let's just go ahead with this. Well, the president would not have supported moving forward if he uh, did not support the legal justification. Uh, he is old school in that way. Uh, but I would tell you that regardless uh, of what is decided by any court, if anything is decided by any court, this is not a permanent solution. It is extended through the beginning of October. And I think you've seen that recognition by a range of members of Congress and leaders and advocates who have been so passionately uh, talking about the need to extend the eviction moratorium. It would require legislative action. The other piece of this that I know we keep talking about but is really a solution here, and that's why we keep talking about it, is getting this money out to states and localities. This is really about money, right, and funding. And all these states and localities have money to extend the moratorium in their states by a month or two months. There have been uh, challenges that are understandable, including the fact that there's no federal infrastructure for distributing this money. The states are doing it on their own. There are challenges where uh, even well-meaning landlords and others are trying to figure out how to accept applications. We're working through those challenges, but that is a solution for the short term, and that's why we've talked about it and why we've spent so much time investing in that as well. I mean, just one more quick one. Uh, the president was very sharp uh, with kind of his perspective on Republican governors mm -hmm. who put specific or block, I guess, specific potential public health. Uh, options it echoed something you'd said yesterday in a very sharp tone either deal with it or move out of the way is that a, uh, an intentional shift what's driving kind of a very sharp tone in regards to these specific actions by Republican government well uh, let me be also clear that uh, as the president said yesterday the vast majority of leaders and as I said too 
continue to step up and do the right thing. People like Governor Hutchison have been traveling their state, hearing from their communities, and answering questions about the vaccine. We're also in constant communication with our nation's governor. So even as we called out steps that, and he called out steps that we felt should have been taken by the governors of Florida and Texas, we're in touch with the, uh, those offices about providing additional assistance and seeing if we can uh, figure out what their needs are and how we can help uh, meet them. And we had our first FEMA team on the ground in West Virginia just days after entering government. Uh, right now, our surge response teams are working hand in hand with the hardest hit states uh, that are not traditionally blue and democratic states. Arkansas, Missouri, Louisiana, focusing on everything from contact tracing, technical expertise, and vaccine confidence. But at the same time, uh, that wasn't an evaluation, a partisan evaluation or assessment. That was an assessment of uh, what isn't happening that would help protect people's lives and save people's lives. And there are leaders who are not stepping up and are getting in the way of the American people, companies, and others who are trying to save lives and stop the spread of Delta. And we are going to keep calling that out. That's not meant to be partisan. It's not meant to be political. Uh, it's just meant to convey um, that uh, more action is needed in some parts of the country, even where there are many states where uh, positive action is being taken. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that the new moratorium is a targeted uh, one and not one that's nationwide as justification of why this is uh, meets the legal threshold. Uh, but Gene Sperling earlier actually pointed out that he said to date the CDC director and her team have been able to find legal authority even for a more targeted eviction moratorium that would just focus on counties with higher rates of COVID spread. So I'm trying to just pinpoint what exactly is, is different than what they were looking at then that makes this now a That was also in our statement. We said to date and we looked at all the and we were continuing to look at all of the legal authorities and options as were the lawyers at the CDC and our lawyers uh, to see what we felt was legally viable. Uh, that process was a couple day process. It wasn't concluded on Monday when uh, Gene Sperling came to the briefing room. Uh, yesterday it concluded and of course they made the announcement as a result. And one more question. What is the White House doing to push forward the nomination of David Chipman at uh, ATF? Uh, the vote could hinge on the vote of Senator Angus King in Maine who has been pu pushed by both uh, local Maine sportsman groups and national gun rights uh, advocates. Has the White House reached out specifically to Senator King on this issue? And is the White House fully uh, committed to Chipman, or might it uh, go with a different nominee at some point? Well, I'm not going to read out private conversations uh, with members of Congress, uh, but I will tell you that uh, we knew this wouldn't be easy. Uh, ATF hasn't had a confirmed director in six years, and only one confirmed director since the position became Senate confirmable. So we've been eyes wide open uh, into the challenge from the beginning. Uh, but we are disappointed um, by the fact that uh, many Republicans are moving in lockstep to try to hold up his nomination and handcuff the chief federal law enforcement agency tasked with fighting gun crimes. It speaks volumes to their complete refusal to tackle the spiking crime we've seen over the last 18 months. This is someone who has 25 years in distinguished service to our country as an ATF agent. He has the exact set of skills and experience we need to revitalize the Bureau's work to crack down on gun trafficking and keep uh, guns out of the hands of criminals. So certainly, yes, we stand by uh, his strong qualifications and nomination. I'm just going to jump around and I'll come back. Okay, uh, go ahead in the middle, in the middle, go ahead. Uh, question. On oh, oh, sorry, go ahead right there in the middle, right there in the middle, yeah. I'm trying to get to people I haven't gotten to. Thank you, I appreciate it. Oh, okay, and then right in front of you. Go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, you're good, you're good. It's fine, you can do everyone. On infrastructure, when you talk to local officials about this, they're really excited about the possibilities of what might happen, but they can't say with any certainty what they're actually going to receive and what they're actually going to be able to do. So as this bill advances, you know, what would you say to folks who are wondering how much of these big pots of money are actually coming to our community and how quickly, assuming it passes, might they find out and see those benefits? Sure. Well, one, we have put out state-by-state state, uh, fact sheets, uh, and if, if different businesses or communities haven't seen those, we're happy to provide them. It is true that, as is true with any piece of legislation, there are components of uh, these the project funding that would be through grants and uh, some through uh, applications that where communities will have to apply for, fun for funding. Uh, obviously, it would be in our interest to get that going as quickly as possible, and the Department of Transportation and others will implement that. But we have been pretty clear about benefits that will help every community, uh, replacing lead pipes 
making sure people have access to broadband, uh, making a, a historic investment in climate. I know people are asking, and I think you're asking specifically about people who, who want to know if their specific bridge is going to be repaired. Some of that will be through grant funding. Some of it will be through um, you know, funding that will be designated in the piece of in the in the bill, but um, you know it will of course take a little bit of time to implement. But we'll we'll be eager to get that done as quickly as the bill is signed into law. Uh, go ahead. So uh, two questions: uh, one about gun violence, and, mm -hmm. and you just alluded to efforts to combat gun violence. The White House has recently touted these strike forces that are going into a few cities to help combat that. Are there any plans to expand that? Kansas City, for example, has had 91 homicides this year, most of them gun related. And how do these DOJ efforts differ from the ones that were going on in the Trump administration when the, there was a lot of ballyhooed effort about going into cities to, to fight crime? Well, I'm not as familiar, nor can I speak to the Trump administration efforts. What I can tell you is that um, the Department of Justice uh, identified these uh, five or six cities where uh, our officials from our team who were experts could work in lockstep to help crack down on gun trafficking and preventing guns from getting into the hands of people who shouldn't have them. And we will see. It's early stages of the, of the process. We will see what the success looks like. We're quite hopeful uh, in terms of whether they have intention or plans to uh, expand, I would point you to the Department of Justice and, and see what they have to say about that. On, on evictions is what role did Congresswoman Bush's protests play? A number of Democratic leaders were giving her a lot of credit for uh, raising the issue. I know the Vice President spoke to her Monday. Mm -hmm. What role did that play in the ultimate decision of the, of the White House to, to move forward with the new order? Well, I don't think anyone could hear uh, Congresswoman Bush's own personal story and experience and see her advocacy and her passion and not be moved by that. Uh, I know a number of members of Congress were moved by that as well. Uh, what I will tell you is that uh, the President had a number of calls uh, with Speaker Pelosi over the weekend. Um, her advocacy, her commitment to uh, looking to see, kicking every tire, just to go back to the analogy of yesterday, uh, to see what was possible uh, is something that was certainly impactful and influential with the president. But I would just reiterate that the president called for the extension of the moratorium back in January. CDC extended it three times. Uh, we also uh, have spoken to this uh, over the course of the past several months, and we've been in close touch with a range of members of Congress. So absolutely, the passion, the advocacy of a number of members is something that I think everybody watched closely. Uh, but I think it's important to note that we all shared the same objective and have from the beginning. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's, it's been a while, so I'm hoping to ask you two questions. If okay. That's all right. Uh, first, about the coronavirus pandemic, and then about a, a follow up to Governor Cuomo, the report on him. Uh, on COVID 19, former President Trump has called for China to pay the United States more than $10 trillion in reparations as a result of letting the coronavirus escape Wuhan and infect other countries, causing, of course, 600,000 American deaths and uh, economic devastation. President Biden hasn't called for reparations from China. Does he support them? Does he think that China should pay us financially for what uh, it has allowed to spread? Our policy hasn't changed. Um, so is he open to? Did you have another question? Yes. Um, <laughs> on, in a follow-up to the report on Governor Cuomo's sexual harassment, a lot of men in politics have been accused of sexual harassment. Uh, President Biden was accused by female Secret Service agents of skinny dipping in front of them, offending them, according to former Washington Post reporter Ronald Kessler, who's an author as well. Uh, his former Senate aide, Tara Reid, accused him of sexual assault. Uh, the Washington Post and the New York Times have published multiple accounts of women who objected to the way President Biden touched them. Uh, should there be an independent investigation of allegations into the president as there was into Governor Cuomo? Well, first I would say um, the President has been clear and outspoken about the importance of women uh, being uh, respected and having their voices heard and being allowed to tell their stories and people treating them with respect. That has long been his policy, continues to be his policy. Uh, that, those were, that was heavily litigated during the campaign. I understand you're eager to come back to it, uh, but I don't have anything further other than to repeat that he has called for uh, the governor to resign. Go ahead. Given when the Senate passed the bipartisan infrastructure deal, would President Biden like to see uh, the House come immediately back into session, or is he okay waiting until the recess ends um, at the beginning of next month? Uh, he certainly is going to be guided uh, and be talking regularly with uh, Speaker Pelosi about uh, what she recommends and what she thinks the best uh, path forward looks like. 
And you guys have said you guys are not going to return to lockdowns. Now, is that based just on current COVID uh, conditions, or Dr. Fauci today in an interview warned that he is worried about a potentially worse variant that could more affect vaccinated people. So is the guidance on lockdowns just based on current conditions, or is that just a, and could change, or um, is it forever more? Are there not going to be lockdowns? Well, I think uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins have both spoken to this um, in recent days. And what they have conveyed and what it's based on is the fact that we have made a significant amount of progress in the past six months, even as we are fighting uh, the Delta variant, uh, the most transmissible variant we have seen. And that includes 70 percent of the American people getting their first shot, 160, more than 162 million Americans at this point. Uh, that's progress. That ensures that a lot of communities are going to have a great deal of protection, and we're in a different place than we were when there was the period of lockdown. So it's a reflection of that. Um, go ahead, Katie. Thanks. Uh, the president sort of dismissed a question yesterday about whether he would call Governor DeSantis to discuss the situation on the ground in Florida. Does he feel that there is no point in personally reaching out to leaders in Texas and Florida? Well, I, I think just to give you an understanding of how this works, um, our team, led by COVID coordinator Jeff Science, is in touch with all of the governors and is we are working closely with the Florida uh, Florida public health officials and the governor's team to see if we can uh, send a team down there to help address their needs. So that is ongoing. It doesn't mean we aren't going to call out when we think there's more steps that can be taken, but uh, that's an ongoing process and we're hopeful about uh, pro making progress there moving forward. Okay, and the president had a meeting earlier today about preventing future pandemics. Um, can you give us a readout on, on what he heard or discussed and, and what's the administration learning about, about that issue? Well, I, I think the president's view is that even as we're fighting uh, the uh, pandemic and we're continuing to fight it, we need to do everything we can to prepare for future pandemics. That means making sure we have the funding we need and we're headed toward a historic number uh, in this infrastructure bill on that front, uh, but also making sure that he engages with uh, our nation's top scientists and experts, and Dr. Lander is certainly one of them, about how we should prepare, how we should think about preparing. So it is part of an ongoing uh, discussion, an ongoing focus, uh, that we can't keep our eye off of that, even as we're fighting the current pandemic. Does the President feel strongly that that funding should be preserved in the reconciliation package? He, but, he feels confident there's going to be a historic amount of funding in the reconciliation package and is, and is pleased to see that. Afghanistan. Go ahead. Um, to go back to Cory Bush for a second, mm -hmm. can I just confirm or ask, did the president himself personally ever speak with Representative Bush? Uh, I don't believe so, no. Okay. And in terms of, of vaccines, mm -hmm. what does the White House or what does the administration intend to do to get other countries to step up and meet some of those vaccine sharing goals? Well, uh, as you know, it was a part of the discussion at the G7, and there was a significant announcement made by G7 countries about their contribution to uh, the global effort. That's an important step forward. But I think you've also seen international public health experts convey that we're going to need 10, million, 10 billion, 11 billion more doses than we currently have in the global community. So I think our effort is going to be continuing to make this a front and center discussion at global engagements, at global meetings, whether it's UNGA or uh, G the G20 or meetings we'll have in the future, because it is going to require all uh, of the richest countries in the world, including the United States, to step up to uh, increase vaccine donations, to increase manufacturing capacity. Uh, so I think it's more about making it front and center in the global agenda, which the president's indicating he will intend to do, continue to do moving forward. Go ahead, Nancy. Um, just two questions, Jen. Um, President, we know President Biden has called on uh, Cuomo to resign, Governor Cuomo. But in the meantime, does the White House intend to strip him of his leadership position on those bi-weekly governor COVID calls? I'm not sure when the next one is scheduled, uh, but again, uh, I would convey that our, our objective is not to uh, hurt the people of New York in the fight against COVID. Um, if he is no longer the governor of New York, which is certainly what the president made clear of his, is his preference, then we will engage with other people. Uh, but uh, we are not going to take steps to hurt the people of New York in the fight against okay. COVID. And just a second question. Uh, should renters be prepared for the eviction moratorium to end for good on October 3rd? What is the White House's thinking on that? Well, I think it really depends on whether there's legislative action or not. Go ahead. One more question on the eviction moratorium. I'll approach it this way. Uh, the president may support the legal justification, but he also publicly gave voice to doubts about the constitutionality 
What's the White House's message then to Americans who heard what happened yesterday, heard what that was said at this podium on Monday, mm -hmm. can't square the two and are now disappointed that the president is signaling that he it doesn't respect the rule of law. I'm not sure there are Americans evaluating it to that degree. Maybe there are some you have talked to. I don't know. What the president has, his message to the American people, especially those who are concerned about uh, losing their homes, being kicked out of their homes, is that he's going to do everything in his power to make sure they can stay in their homes as long as possible. That is not just an extension of the eviction moratorium, which obviously a step was taken yesterday. It is also about using every tool at our disposal to get this money out. Again, states have the funding to extend the eviction moratorium in their own states. That's because there was funding in the American Rescue Plan to get that done. So that includes asking his team, members of his cabinet, whether it's, uh, the, uh, whether it's Secretary Fudge, who obviously made an announcement today, or the Department of Treasury, who made an announcement about the simplification of forms, that this is a priority, that they are to use all resources at their disposal to make sure they're communicating with Americans, that we are making it easy to get this funding out, uh, because that's the overall objective. The overall objective is not about one tool. It is about keeping people in their homes. That's the goal. But the president's a lawyer, spent 36 years in the Senate, was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, eight years of vice president, half a year as president. He speaks often about democracy versus autocracy. He's issuing or overseeing this order from the CDC in the face of doubts about its constitutionality, which he seemed to echo yesterday. There's no inconsistency here. The president is, I mean, there are, there are many people out there who say that the president is, is, is essentially not uh, giving voice to the ethic that he campaigned on. He didn't call Congress back. He asked Congress to act. It didn't. How do you square all that? You know, I'm going to ask you who's saying that. Well, there are plenty of people who are saying it. They are not just Republicans. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that to others to figure out. But I think what's important to note here is that the president would not have moved forward with a step where he didn't feel comfortable and confident in the legal justification. It is also a reality that there are legal steps that have been taken by the Supreme Court in the last few months. And we have spoken to that publicly. We're not going to hide from that. But he asked the CDC and his legal experts to look at what is possible. This is a narrow, targeted, moratorium that is different from the national moratorium. It's not an extension of that. It's a different moratorium from a policy and legal standpoint. So he felt comfortable in the justification and uh, the legal approach to this effort. Quick follow up on that, Jen. Uh huh. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, you. You mentioned that the president is old school, and, and Steve noted that the, the president spent a significant amount of time in the Senate and is also a lawyer. Um, when, what was the moment that the president became certain that he was on solid legal uh, standing to move forward with this extension? And what was the, the argument, specific legal argument, that won out and changed his mind? Because yesterday he seemed to be weighing the two, the two options. Well, again, as I've been discussing, the justification from the legal team is that this is a different moratorium. It's narrow. It's targeted at the highest, at the areas highest impacted. It is not an extension of the national moratorium that was struck down just six weeks ago. So, is is the sense here that you know this is temporary? It's still an open question about the constitutionality, but it is temporary. It was extended until October third. So it's it's still a question of whether or not this is constitutional, but it's worth it. I didn't say that. Well, that, um, that I he would not have advocated for and supported moving forward with something if he was not comfortable with the legal justification. Let me just go around. You, go ahead to the middle here. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Uh, I have two quick questions. First, I was hoping you could preview a little bit the uh, president's meeting tomorrow with the API leaders. I'm just curious what they'll be discussing and why you just invite them to the White House. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I should have had more of a preview for you, but I will tell you that uh, the president looks forward to meeting with leaders of the AAPI uh, community tomorrow. Uh, they will discuss a range of topics, uh, including, of course, uh, economic investment, the fight against COVID, uh, voting rights, uh, which is certainly an issue that is of great importance to a range of communities uh, who have been quite active uh, on this issue, uh, and obviously uh, it, continuing uh, discrimination that members of the AAPI community uh, experience. Uh, we've also uh, proud of the number of uh, nominees uh, from the AAPI community that we have put forward for a range of important jobs in the administration, but those are some of the topics on his agenda, and I'm sure they'll come ready with a number of topics they also want to discuss. Just on COVID, um, yeah. the president yesterday was asked um, 
whether he thinks more cities and states should follow New York City's lead and institute rules, um, you know, essentially requiring people to, to have been vaccinated to go to restaurants and stuff like that. And he said, I do, but then he later seemed to suggest maybe you should fall more on those businesses. Um, I was just hoping you could clarify, does the president, would he urge um, you know, cities and states to, to follow New York City's lead, or does he feel that it's more sort of a private sector matter where businesses should be the ones uh, you know, taking the lead on this type of thing? Well, both. I mean, there are steps that are going to be taken by localities. There will be steps taken by businesses. The president supports local efforts to keep communities safe. They're going to be different from community to community. And uh, our view is that any verification program should meet a few standards. Accessibility, it needs to be free and available in paper and digital formats, should be secure and private, non-discriminatory, given equity is at the center of our agenda. But uh, he does, we, we know, we will see more local communities do more and more things in this space, including verification and employee mandates. That will incentivize vaccinations, and we're encouraged and supportive of innovative steps at the local level. I just want to jump around. Go ahead to the back. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Oh, I'll go after. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I have two questions. One on Quad. Early this uh, year, during the virtual summit, Quad countries decided on vaccine production. Has the president set a deadline or timeline for when these vaccines will be produced for the rest of the world? I don't believe there's a, t a deadline that has been set. Um, it's a good question. Let me see if there's anything more specific. Obviously, uh, working with the Quad on COVID vaccines uh, is an important part of our – oh, let me see. Okay. Thank you for the question because I was like, I know something more on this. Um, our Quad partnership is on track to help produce at least 1 billion doses of COVID vaccines in India for the Asia region by the end of 2022. So that is the timeline, obviously more, hopefully more sooner rather than later, but that's the timeline for the work with the Quad. Uh, my other question is about the kids of legal immigrants because of the aging out process. Many of them feel that they will be deported back home to a country where they have never lived. Uh, some of them have been moving around the city, meeting the congressman and the White House as well. One of them, at least, I met the president in Pennsylvania. Has the president given any assurance to these kids that instead of focusing on their studies, they they are now right to focusing For on DACA the DACA recipients or uh, the legal immigrants, kids of legal immigrants, not the DACA recipients. Yeah. Because uh, the aging out process, uh, mm -hmm. they might be forced to go back. Sure, it's a great question. I'll, I'll have to check, obviously, uh, taking steps to ensure we are providing a legal pathway to citizenship and uh, especially for kids who came into this country, as you referenced, um, uh, you know, uh, innocently with their family members. Um, but I will see if there's anything new to report on that front. Um, go ahead in the back. I wanted to ask about a different moratorium, the payments of student loans. Mm -hmm. That expires at the end of September. What is the White House doing at this point to get ready for that date and figure out next steps? I don't have any preview for you on what determination will be made on that front. Do you have any information on uh, how you're preparing? I mean, we got to the point of the moratorium that we've been talking about earlier where we're at the date. Yep. What are you doing between now and that date? We are certainly well aware of the date, well aware of the impact, um, but I don't have anything to preview in terms of a decision. And I wanted to ask one more question about the sure. Justice Department. Um, the slot for Solicitor General is still open um, with the Supreme Court ending, first session ending several months ago at this point and going into some cases that I'm sure the administration really cares about. Where are you at on picking someone and what are you doing to get ready for that? I don't have anything to preview for you on any personnel announcements or decisions. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Shelby. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask about a Harris poll released this week mm -hmm. that indicates the majority of Americans believe the worst of the pandemic is still ahead. And this is a big change from a few weeks ago. And so this is despite, as you said, 70% of Americans being vaccinated and CDC data showing that the vaccine is protecting vaccinated Americans from serious illness. So uh, why is the American public so panicked? And is the White House concerned at all that it's fueled this dramatic shift in public sentiment? That we have fueled it? Yeah, through, you know, like uh, returning the mass recommendations for vaccinated Americans. Is there, is, is it concerned at all? What, what can it point to as the reason for I haven't really taken a close look at this poll. What I will tell you is that a oh, poll before this, I believe a CBS poll showed that more vaccinated Americans were concerned about the rise of Delta than unvaccinated. So it was that was even prior to the mask guidance putting uh, being put in place. And certainly, as people see 
um, you know, the rising cases in certain communities, unvaccinated communities, uh, of course that's concerning. We understand that. Um, but we also believe that it is our responsibility to provide accurate public health information and also make clear to people the impact of being vaccinated and the fact that the vaccines are doing exactly what they should do, which is protect the vast majority of people from serious illness and hospitalization. Uh, but yes, we are. We know that it is a, uh, it is a challenge uh, and fighting a pandemic and communicating about it is a challenge. Um, but um, uh, but certainly that's why we do as many briefings as we do, why we, uh, why we come out here every day as we do, and uh, why we'll continue to uh, allow our public health guidance to be, to be in the lead. Go ahead. Yeah, on infrastructure, um, the House Speaker is still saying that the reconciliation bill and the infrastructure bill should be connected. Which bill would the President like to see on his desk first, the bipartisan infrastructure bill or the reconciliation bill? The president looks forward to signing both into law, and uh, he's eager to do that. We've we've certainly made progress, and I'll also note that um, on the uh, reconcilia uh, reconciliation package, which I know we haven't talked about a lot because uh, the infrastructure bill has been front and center, but in the meantime, behind the scenes, which is, by the way, where most of the work happens in places like the White House, our legislative affairs team has had over 375 meetings and calls with members and senior congressional staff about just the reconciliation package. But there's no preference from the president whether he wants to see the reconciliation first or he's he's going to uh, he's going to stay in close coordination and uh, and rely on the guidance and leadership of uh, Leader Schumer and Speaker Pelosi. And how does the as the leader of the Democratic Party how does he get uh, House Speaker Pelosi on the same page? that they're not connected. Well, again, I think the president's been clear that he wants to sign both into law. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're encouraged by the movement of the infrastructure package forward, and we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes, and the president will continue to advocate for publicly the reconciliation package, given how important his Build Back Better agenda is to him. We're told you have a hard out, shortly, just one or two more. Sure, okay, go ahead. The president uh, made an announcement on Lebanon recovery today. Can you outline that for us? Sure. And uh, also give us a sense, of, given the fact this is the one-year anniversary of that blast that devastated Beirut, how important is Lebanon's political and economic stability to the United States, given the crisis it's in right now? Uh, absolutely. Um, it's, it's very important. Um, on behalf um, uh, of the country, uh, the president sent his deepest condolences to all those who were injured, lost loved ones, and still struggle to recover from the trauma from the catastrophic explosion at the Port of Beirut one year ago. Today, we actually did a video um, from him that we're happy to provide to anyone uh, who is interested. We also recognize that the people of Lebanon have suffered more over the past year because of avoidable political and e economic crises. So what we announced today um, is um, uh, we uh, nearly $100 million in new humanitarian assistance that is on top of the almost $560 million in humanitarian aid that we have provided to Lebanon over the last two years. We recognize the important role Lebanon has played in the region, as you referenced, and also their role in hosting over one million Syrian refugees for a number of years. And we're quite proud of our longstanding support for the Lebanese people. Uh, and the president urges his fellow leaders and capitals around the world to also step up uh, their support for the Lebanese people. Um, no amount of outside assistance, of course, will be enough to um, to uh, repair uh, the the pain from from the blast just last year. Yeah. Okay, uh, Nikki, go ahead. Great. Um, are there any plans for the president to hold a press conference before he goes to the beach? I expect he might take some questions at some point, but no plans for a formal press conference. We've got a lot going on here, as you all know. Also, any chance that Team USA might be visiting post Olympics? I hope so. They're invited. I'm inviting them here to my house. <laughs> Anywhere you want to come. I hope so. I have nothing to pre to. I don't have anything on the schedule, but uh, certainly that's a tradition, and uh, the president is probably as obsessed with the Olympics as I am, if not more. So I expect that there will be an invitation at some point. Uh, I think we have to wrap it up. To thank you, everyone. Have a great day. See you tomorrow. I hope so. We're still working it out, but let me see where we are with that.